Well, good morning, everybody. Bear with me as I sort out my paperwork. Um, one more notice. Tuesday week, um, the men's group that we go to um, is going to be having a breakup and a fishing night. So any other blokes who want to participate, um, come and see me afterwards and I'll give you the details. We're going to meet down the beach. There's plenty of shorefront there. And bring your own food for tea. If you're a man of faith, you might eat fish. But, um, so that's Tuesday the 7th uh, and from about 6 o'clock. We're going to be down the beach. Um, let me know if that's something you'd like to participate in. It's my privilege to introduce the next sermon series to us today. And it's up on the screen, Footsteps of the King. And it's a sermon series which is going to last for six months. And how it's basically going to work out today is that for probably about two-thirds of my time, I'm just going to be unpacking that to give you a sense of where we're going with it. And following that, we're going to have a bit of devotion and just get into God's Word and just really soak in the glory of our Lord. Some of the things I've got to say today are really just boasting in my Lord. I'm, I'm just looking forward to talking about my Jesus. And uh, so I want to share that with you guys, my church family. How about we pray? Father, we come before you today. Father, we thank you for uh, the worship time that we've had. Lord, I don't know what uh, is in people's hearts here today, but you do. Father, I pray that right now we might just take a deep breath, including myself, and just lay it all on the altar. But we thank you, Lord, that you see all and that you love us dearly. Amen. <clears throat> I um, struggled a little bit preparing this sermon because I struggled with anxiety. But one thing I know is that you guys are my church family and I know that you love me and um, I'm also really excited about what I want to share. I want to start with a question for you to think about, and it is this. What do you celebrate in the course of a year? What do you celebrate in the course of a year? There's actually lots of things. There's lots of answers to that. There's the hallmark ways of celebrating um, Mother's Day and Father's Day, worthwhile things to pause and to think about, um, remembering our parents and how much they mean to us. There's our birthdays, there's anniversaries. When we think about um, the high value we place on marriage, worthwhile celebrating when those anniversaries come around. So there's lots of things like that. Valentine's Day, I like to say that every day is a Valentine's Day with Sue. Um, corny, that was corny. Then there's national holidays. There's Anzac Day and um, Remembrance Day, where we remember those who have uh, sacrificed themselves in war for us. There's Australia Day. There's New Year's Day. There's a whole lot of different ways that a year is punctuated by celebrations. There's sporting days. There's the last Saturday in September when Port Power play another team in the AFL next year. Go the Power. The Boxing Day test. The day after Christmas. You've got a fridge full of food, you get a heap of prawns on your plate and you sit down and watch the first three overs of the Boxing Day test before you fall asleep. There's lots of different ways that a year is punctuated by different celebrations. Some of them are sombre, Anzac Day, and some of them are celebrations where we are just thankful. We think of New Year's Day, we look back, we look forward, things like that. The Israelites were distinctive in how they celebrated and what they celebrated. And I think that we can learn something from that, the way that the Israelites celebrated. They had many celebrations which recalled God's saving hand. They looked back in the history and said, remember when God did that? I wanted to talk about two examples. The first one comes from the book of Esther. So in the book of Esther, the uh, Israelites are in Persia and uh, they're slated for destruction. They're going to get wiped out. Every last one of them, genocide, they're going to be wiped out. And Esther, this weak vessel, puts it all on the line and goes in before the king, which could end her life. 
and God uses her to save the people. And there's this day in history when they're meant to get wiped out. It's a day of sorrow and fear and mourning, and it becomes a day of joy because God miraculously rescues them. Here's some scripture. Mordecai, who was a godly man, sent letters. This was the wash-up after this event. Sent letters to all the Jews, obliging them to keep the 14th day of the month Adar and also the 15th day of the same, year by year. Make them days of feasting and gladness. And they still do this, by the way. It's a bit like April Fool's Day. They have pretend ads in the paper and, um, you know, they have to have a good day and schools are closed and they enjoy themselves. The Jews firmly obligated themselves and their offspring and all who joined them that without fail they would keep these two days according to what was written and at the time appointed every year. You see how their year was punctuated by celebration. Remember when God did that? Remember when he came through for us, when we desperately needed him? Another festival that the Jews have is the Passover. The Jews are a captive people, the Hebrews, and that they're, they're stuck in Egypt, oppressed, and God miraculously saves them. He sends all the plagues. And the last great plague is the plague of death. The plague of death is going to come and every firstborn is going to be killed. But to those houses where they sacrifice the lamb and put the blood of the lamb over the, the top of the door, the angel of death will pass over those homes. As a result of that, they're miraculously saved. They're taken out of Egypt by God's strong hand and established as God's people in their own country eventually. Here's some scripture on that down the bottom too. Then Moses said to the people following this event, remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand the Lord brought you out from this place. You shall therefore keep this statute at its appointed time from year to year. Their year was punctuated with celebrating God's hand in salvation. Time itself was sacred to the Jews as they remembered God being part of their history. They didn't just remember, they partook of it. They feasted. It wasn't just their ancestors' salvation, it was their salvation that they were part of. So the question that I would like to ask you now, what about for us as Christians? What about for us as Christians? God's saving acts for us are centred in the person of Jesus. Christ is the centre of all. We look at um, the Old Testament prophecies that point to his coming, um, his incarnation. God, the great God of eternity, put on human flesh. The all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful God of eternity becomes one of us. Magnificent. The details around his birth, Jesus' life and ministry, his sacrificial death on our behalf, his glorious resurrection, his ascension to the Father, the coming of the Spirit and the birth of the church. These events, friends, are the core central events of history. There's nothing else in all of history that is more important than these events. Everything before Christ, I read this somewhere, everything before Christ finds fulfilment in Christ. All of those Old Testament festivals in some way point to Jesus. Everything after Christ finds its meaning by pointing back to Christ, including your life. You ultimately find meaning in your life because of Jesus and because of what happened with him 2,000 years ago. I like to call it the epicentre of history. All of history is rocked by those events. How may we celebrate, oh, I'm getting caught up here. How may we celebrate and remember the events of our salvation? How may we celebrate? Well, we do it in lots of ways. We do it daily. 
Um, if, if you're following the Lord, hopefully you have a time, a, a quiet time before God where you're remembering and uh, being grateful to God for what he's done, reflecting on that, reading his word, and just sitting in his presence and saying, thank you so much for who you are and what you've done. We do it weekly, a weekly rhythm of coming here to church. And why are we here on a Sunday? We're here on a Sunday because this is the resurrection day. This is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And because he lives, we also will live. Our great hope. We're not just here for the good coffee after church. We're here because we have this great hope which we have in Christ. What about yearly? What about yearly celebrations? The Israelites had their year punctuated by these events. What about for us as Christians? Well, we have Christmas and Easter, the two main events in the Christian calendar. And today what I want us to think about is the Christian calendar and how we can just follow that for this next six months and really appreciate afresh uh, the salvation events of Jesus. My experience has been over most of my life that I get caught up at this time of the year in all sorts of stuff. Um, There's end of year parties to attend. There's preparations for Christmas. I could say there's presents to buy, but Sue buys them all. Um, When the kids open their presents, I'm as surprised as they are usually. Um, But I have to buy hers. There's lots of things that take our time and sometimes shift our focus away from the celebration itself. Somehow our devotion can get muscled out of the way because of the busyness of life. That's been my experience. I have found personally that following the Christian calendar, which was established in the fourth century, is one way that these events can be enriched. You don't have to. There's no law about this. There's no just doing it by rote. But we have a wonderful heritage in 2,000 years of Christianity. We don't embrace everything, but there's some things which are really valuable and it's a lovely way of following in the footsteps of our Lord by looking at the Christian calendar. What's so good about it? I wrote this down. Our ordinary days are informed with the big picture of God's salvation events. As we walk through our ordinary lives, we're reminded of God's salvation events. And the Christian calendar gives us unique opportunities to celebrate together as a family what God has done. Because you know what? I haven't just been saved individually. I've been saved into a body, a body of believers. Here's a quote from a guy called Robert Weber, who's now in glory. Within the cycle of a year... The church unfolds the whole mystery of Christ from his incarnation and birth until his ascension, the day of Pentecost and the expectation of blessed hope and of the Lord's return. I love that idea of unfolding. As a a group of believers, we enact again, like the Israelites uh, reminding themselves of what God has done, we enact again the events of salvation. So it's a wonderful opportunity to go deep with our Lord. We have a rich heritage in 2,000 years of Christianity. We don't embrace everything. We want to make sure that God's word is the foundation and Christ is at the centre. I believe that it gives us a unique opportunity for worship. Worship is having thanksgiving for what God has done, at least in part. It's a unique opportunity for evangelism as we declare what God has done to other people. So, now the next slide's a bit scary, okay? Oh boy, pie graphs on a Sunday morning. Um, Thanks to Frank for putting this together. I did a, a pie graph um, on Excel, and it looked terrible. It looked mathematical, and I thought, I really, I don't want people to be looking at that Sunday morning, but 
I wrote it down for uh, Frank on a bit of paper and he came up with this. And what I want to do is just for the next few moments is unpack um, the Christian calendar. Slightly simplified, but essentially this is what the Christian calendar is. And the reason I want to do that is because we're going to be looking at this for the next six months. Okay, Footsteps of the King, that's the title of the sermon series. The Christian calendar involves two distinct cycles. There's a cycle of light, which is the yellow shades at the top, and there's a cycle of life, the green shades down the bottom. Each cycle lasts for about 14 weeks, and we are currently in Advent, the first Sunday of four of Advent. A scripture that I think summarises the cycle of light really well is the one I've got written over on the left there. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. What a beautiful scripture. The coming of our Lord. And so we are in Advent at the moment, and Advent is this time of anticipation. Why were the people of God expecting the Messiah? because of the prophecies in the Old Testament, primarily in Isaiah, but not only, they knew there was going to be this coming king. And so we remember the Israelites waiting and we think about what it was like to be waiting for the coming king because we also can identify with them in that we're waiting for the king to return as well, as has already been pointed out by Crystal. You don't have to have candles at Advent. You don't have to have those symbols. Um, Sue and I do, and we find that it's quite useful because we have one candle lit today. Next week, there's two. And what happens is there's this growing sense of light. The light of the world is coming. And so we have it that's symbolised by candles in our house. Just something that you can do if you wanted to. And so we move on to the second stage in the cycle of light, which is Christmas, which is fulfilment. The King has come. The great king, the one that's been expected for so long, has finally come. Christmas is a time of joy. It's a time of gladness and feasting. It's a time of gift giving as we think about the greatest gift that we've ever received. Moving on. Oh, and Christmas is also a time when we think about the incarnation and dwell upon that and get lost in the glory of our Lord. And so we come to the third and last section in the cycle of light, which is proclamation, epiphany. Epiphany is probably a strange word. What it really means is manifestation. Jesus began to show his glory. See, there were a few miraculous events around Jesus' early life. When he was born, the shepherds, the wise men, um, going to the temple. But largely, Jesus wasn't known in those early years to the beginning of his ministry. But then Jesus is baptised and he comes up out of the water and there's the voice of the Father, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. The Spirit descends on him like a dove. Did you hear that voice? What was that? We're glimpsing the glory of God, the glory of the Son. And so we see progressively the glory of of Jesus. And that's what we focus on. It's just this, this period of time when we consider the, the beauty and the wonder of God becoming one of us and revealing his glory. He walks on water. He calms the weather with a word. He raises dead people, heals the sick, casts out demons. Magnificent. He provides um, food in the wilderness for people that were hungry. And for those people that were there, they would be looking back to the Old Testament and saying, God provided manna for us in the wilderness. Who is this guy? We start to glimpse his glory. The very last um, Sunday in Epiphany, we look at the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus goes up the Mount with Peter, James and John, and he's literally transfigured before them. His bright light. Moses and Elijah are there with him and they talk about what he's going to accomplish in Jerusalem, which is his death. Peter says some strange stuff because he's confronted by the glory of Jesus. 
this guy who started off just being, you know, special, is suddenly seeing him in his glory. Theologians would say that um, the Mount of Transfiguration forms a turning point in the ministry of Jesus because after that point, he was heading for Jerusalem. He says he set his face to go to Jerusalem to accomplish that which he primarily came for. And so that begins the next cycle, which is the cycle of life. Summarised, I think, in this scripture in John 12, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And so we enter this period, this cycle of life, and enter Lent. During Lent, we consider what it was like for Jesus to be walking to Jerusalem, heading to Jerusalem to sacrifice himself for us. We consider what does it mean for me as a Christian to live for him? What does it mean to carry my cross? What does it mean to be a servant? What does it mean to lay it on the altar like we've heard sung before? Lent is a time of, of um, fasting and prayer, self-reflection and confession as we prepare for this most special of events, which is Easter. We're getting through it, guys. That's four out of six. And so we come to Easter, the most sacred time in the Christian calendar. Only goes for one week. They call it Holy Week. It starts with the triumphal entry. Such a beautiful event. Jesus coming in on a borrowed donkey. And I think about conquerors in history that come in on a war horse to defeat a nation. And Jesus comes in on a borrowed borrow donkey and defeats death for you and for I, submitted to the Father. And as Jesus enters Jerusalem, we enter in to this most holy of events and peer in at the events of salvation once more. Towards the end of Holy Week, there is something called the Great Tridium. It's a great three days. It begins with Maundy Thursday through to Easter Sunday. You've probably heard the term Maundy, strange sort of term. It basically means New Commandment Thursday. New Commandment Thursday. On that Thursday, we look at the Upper Room Dialogue when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. And then Jesus took off his outer garment and knelt before his disciples and washed their feet. And he said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, even so that you would love one another. Powerful when we look at that in the context of Easter. Think about that. Good Friday, the day that Jesus sacrificed himself for us. Easter Saturday, what do we do Easter Saturday? Go to Bunnings. Maybe. Um, I, for me, one thing I want to do on Easter Saturday is have a time where possible of silence and, and prayer and uh, fasting and preparation for feasting on the next day. And so that's something I'll be calling you guys to do if you want to. You're free. You don't have to. But it's a great way to just enrich that time, to press the pause button and to think about what our Lord has done for us. Easter Sunday, the resurrection, most magnificent. The last uh, section of the pie graph is Eastertide and Pentecost. Eastertide is the period from, from uh, the resurrection to the ascension. And in that period, we look at uh, Jesus' teachings on the church. We look at his post-resurrection appearances when he reinstated Peter, uh, when he talked to Thomas about faith. We talk about the church, what it means to be the church, because Jesus is going back to the Father. What does it mean to serve one another? And lastly, we talk about the empowering of the Spirit. You know, we can't, we can't do what Jesus needs us to do without his empowering. Without his empowering, we haven't got a hope. But his Spirit has come, 
and indwells us and empowers us to do that work. And so we look at the empowering of the Spirit and the birth of the church. Okay. How'd you go? You've got a test now. No. Great. I just got this written down. We had a question. We're studying the Sermon on the Mount series with our Bible study. And there was a question in the series that said this, Jesus promises that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be filled. What can you do to cultivate a healthy, hearty spiritual appetite? What can you do to cultivate a healthy, hearty spiritual appetite? Again, there's lots of answers to that question. But I would say, be astounded again at the glory of our Lord Jesus. Submit your life again. Confess your brokenness. Worship at his feet. There's nothing like boasting about my Lord. I love it. I I just am so... The the glory of who he is just at times is overwhelming. And it makes me hunger and thirst to be more like him. This season of following in the footsteps of Jesus lasts six months and it begins today. Okay. And what I'd like to do, as I promised, is we're just going to get into God's word and just read a bit in a moment. In a moment, I'll invite Jess to come up to help me with that. And I want to look at Isaiah 11, uh, 1 to 5. And here's Isaiah 11, 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. This is from Isaiah, reliably dated 700 BC, approximately 700 BC. Isaiah is looking back a further 300 years to the time of King David. And he's talking about the promise that was made to King David through the prophet Nathan from God. And the short version of it goes something like this. David wanted to build God a house. And he asked the prophet Nathan, "Um, what do you reckon? I'll, I'll build God a house. And Nathan says, do what's in your heart. And then Nathan goes away and God speaks to him and corrects what he said. And Nathan comes back to David and says, you want to build God a house? I'll tell you this, I'm going to build a house through David. One of his descendants is going to have an everlasting kingdom, a kingdom that will never end. And so here in Isaiah, Isaiah is looking back to that promise. Most magnificent. What I'd like to do now is invite Jess to come out and just grab a mic. And I've got a reflection. What I've done is I've just uh, thought about uh, verses 2 to 5, which I've got up there. And I've thought about how, how Jesus fulfills those scriptures. 700 years before he was born. And there's many answers to how he fulfills those scriptures. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the scripture and Jess is going to read uh, how that is fulfilled. Great. And you don't have to read. You might just want to sit with your eyes closed. Just relax and just let this wash over you. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. John 1, 32. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Matthew 21, 13. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes 
but what his ears hear. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. John 8, 7. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. John 8, 10 through 11. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Matthew 23, 23 to 24. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Luke 22 to 42. Thank you. God's plan, a thousand years before speaking through the prophet Nathan, 700 years before through the prophet Isaiah, one day, Someone would come who would make all things right. I wonder if you lived after the time of Isaiah, maybe 500 years after the time of Isaiah, whether you would be thinking, this is improbable. Can you feel the improbability of it? Looking back 500 years and saying, there was this mad prophet who had wishful thinking because he lived just before the Babylonian captivity and he had wishful thinking that there would be this great king that would come. But then the miraculous occurs in God's timing. God's promises are sure. During Advent, we remember the Israelites waiting and remind ourselves that Jesus is coming again. We live between those appearances. And it's my job to ask you, is he reigning in your heart today? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. And Father, we thank you for this sermon series, uh, just following in the footsteps of Jesus. Father, I pray that our hearts will be encouraged. Father, I pray that we will keep short accounts with you as we pursue you. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.